So if it's a relationship problem, the only way to fix it is with a relationship solution. The idea of getting you know, one nation to sort of bow to the other and impose its solution on uh, the other is a recipe for unmitigated disaster, conflict, and probably war. It didn't have to be this way, argues Yale professor Stephen Roach in his latest book, Accidental Conflict, America, China, and the Clash of False Narratives. The U.S. and China are hiking up, as Kissinger has called it, the foothills of a Cold War. How did we get here? And is there anything that can be done for both countries to turn around on this path, moving from an unhealthy codependency to a robust interdependency? Full disclosure, Professor Roach's class on China's economy was the first China course I ever took, put me down on this path. He also was almost the first ever guest on China Talk. I was in like a like hostel in Guilin and the internet cut out too many times and we figured we'd just do it another time. Here we are uh, six years later with um, much more of an audience than I could have promised you of maybe my family back in 2017. Professor, it's an honor to have you on the show. Well, Jordan, it's um, great to see one of my students make it in, in the... Um... The big stage. So you've done a terrific job, and I'm proud of the uh, the work you've done in, in bringing this debate to life. And, and I'm proud of seeing, in, in, as being a follower, uh, you know how much knowledge you've acquired in, in various aspects of the the China debate over the years. So that's terrific. So I'm going to be honest with you. I hesitated to do this show for months, not because I didn't like the book but because of how sad it was. And, you know, nowadays, like I th folks have probably noticed on the feed, I just do a lot fewer US China shows because it seems really hopeless and it seems like we're heading to a really dark place. So I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I guess I want to start with <laughs> the wildest thing that you put in this book, which was on page 52, you have a chart which is the of the DSM American Psychiatric Association defensive functioning scale, which runs through high adaptive level down to mental inhibitions, minor image distorting level, disavowal, major image distorting level, action level, and defensive dysregulation of all the things that people in a relationship can do poorly. How did this end up in a book about U.S. and China? Well, it's a stretch, number one, to apply uh, a framework of um, relationship psychology or relationship pathologies to, to countries. But, you know, it's been something I've, I've been flirting with and um, thinking about for uh, a long, long time. And it you know, just goes back to my early days in, in trying to understand what was it that bugged the U.S. about China? And I just started uncovering all of these uh, false narratives, false impressions that I thought were pretty much, you know, they had some fact to them, but they were taken so far out of context and ended up distorting our image of China to fit flaws in our own uh, self-image. And that sounded sort of, you know, pretty much like a, a human psychology framework. And so I started reading about it. I did not go to therapy, but I figured out that, you know, this particular pathology is, is pretty well known, but there's another side to it. And, and that's when this book came together, when I recognized and, and was able to identify, didn't really have to stretch to do it, that China suffered from the same type of distorting framework. And so the, the role of sort of relationship economics reflects the fact that both of these, you know, gigantic, powerful nations are far more vulnerable than they like to believe. Uh, and they mask those vulnerabilities by uh, essentially blaming others for self-inflicted problems. So that was the genesis of this notion of dueling false narratives. And then I had to go and start to do a lot of research on filling in the pieces. And that's what the bulk of this book is about. Four chapters on America's false narratives of China, four, four chapters on China's false narratives of the U.S. And, and I added a lot that brought these misimpressions together, you know, a, 
the first part of the book goes through the relationship dynamic that started out of a out as an innocent marriage of convenience where the dependency deepened both ways uh, china depended on the us as a you know its biggest market for external demand and it needed that for export led growth as i taught you in the class you took from me but then i said you know wait a second i mean american consumers are just as needy they need cheap goods increasingly higher quality cheap goods from china to make ends meet because their incomes are under pressure they needed china to buy our treasuries because we didn't have enough domestic savings to fund uh, our own um, uh, and budget deficits and ultimately we needed china to as a source for our own export demand china's quietly emerged as our third largest and most rapidly growing export market so that was the aha moment it's a two-way uh, dependency and um in the, you read that dsm scale of, of conflict escalation uh what it told me is that when one partner changes the rules of engagement the other one feels scorned left behind starts to blame the other and conflict arises and here we are we're in a horrific uh, conflict between two uh, nations that are masking their own in internal vulnerabilities and taking it out on each other you think about the cold war and the start of the cold war and you literally had i mean <laughs> the us and the soviet union were allies in a war and it took three years for that to completely fall apart and you know watching a version of that it's not the same thing and you know this this trade is not going to go away the interdependencies are, are not going to dematerialize anytime soon but it's it's the sort of psychology of it because there are things that you could that you can see the other side of. I think we, you know, some of the points in your book, I find a little more nefariousness, um, frankly, than you do. Um, but I don't necessarily want to sort of litigate, you know, point by point, you know, how scary is China technology? How scary is Huawei? But going from thinking things are 60-40 to 70-30 to all of a sudden, we can't trust these guys. They're up to no good. The system's rotten. This is inevitable. We just need to get there sooner. Um, we need to get on a competitive footing sooner than they do so we don't fall behind. There are real psychological things that are going on that are driving this beyond just the sort of like objective fact pattern. Um, and, and, and thinking about how to sort of disaggregate what are the sort of fears and anxiety, national, you know, sort of leadership fears and anxieties, national fears and anxieties, and how that layers on to the fact patterns that both, you know, both capitals are, are looking at and reacting to, I think is important and not something that um, uh, people give enough uh, time or credence to. Well, I mean, what worries me is what you said at the outset of that, that thought, and that is that we, we have transformed the concept of competition, which I believe is, is important and powerful and, and a good thing because it brings out uh, the best uh, in competitors to an existential threat. And how did we go from competition to an existential threat? How did we go from uh, you know a nation that has always had some issues with China, but was in favor of uh, engagement, uh, interaction at, at all levels, from student foreign exchange programs to um, multinationals setting up uh, joint ventures uh, to to governments working together? How did we go from that? to where we are right now. I mean, can you name one sitting member of the U.S. Senate or the U.S. House of Representatives, just one that is in favor of uh, any type of constructive engagement with China? I can't, and I've you know, gone through the roster a lot. I, you might stretch to include one or two, but, but, but the, it's sort of like the verdict is in. China, we know the enemy, we've seen it, and it's China. It takes me back. Um, I was actually alive then, but I was not sort of um, a, a fully functioning uh, cognitive adult at the time. But the early 50s, I mean, the, um, you know, the, the red baiting of uh, Senator McCarthy from Wisconsin. The Soviet Union was the existential threat, the dire threat. And he used that uh, threat to destroy uh, careers and uh, individuals that had any uh, slightest bit of 
sympathy with uh, communism uh, or uh, the Soviet Union. You know, is, that, is that where we're headed? I don't know. But let's let's stay on a bit of, a bit on how we got there for a second. So you brought up in the beginning of that conversation how we got here. And I think the the variable that seems to me to be the one that sticks out the most is Xi Jinping. And you know, there are aspects of this in your book where you sort of gesture towards look, we may be looking at a very different system than the one that America was comfortable, you know, pursuing a a policy of engagement with. And when you sort of, uh, in your book, keep coming back to these themes of like both sides need to sort of reflect and change and, you know, question what they're coming from and what they really want, it really takes two to tango. And I am very pessimistic that first, you know, premise one, like she, as long as he's around, is going to is going to sort of change the way he he looks at the party and the world. And second, the U.S. system, if they see she's still there, is going to is going to question and um, uh, potentially come to different conclusions on any of the assumptions that they've made about, um, you know, future competition and China's strategic intentions. So thoughts or questions or pushback on uh, on what keeps me sad? Well, first of all, you know, it's not good to stay sad. You know, I I just go back to my own trajectory as a China watcher, watcher, which I would say you know, goes back to the Wall Street days. It's, it's basically 25 years of watching China and the relationship between the U.S. and China. I bet it was an optimist throughout almost all of that. And um, it started in the Asian financial crisis where you know, one dynamic uh, East Asian economy after another was crumbling. I'd been to China a few times, but had no idea what was going on there. I started going there a lot and figured out in late 97 that China was cut from a different cloth. Started really uh, as a Wall Street economist on China and became hugely optimistic for you know a lot of reasons. But that I would summarize as the, the power of the Deng Xiaoping model turbocharged by WTO accession at a time when global trade was taking off in the early 2000s. And then um, a, you know, a big moment, a pivotal moment for me came was in 2007, the former premier, Wen Jiabao, raised some big questions about the sustainability of the model. He said the economy is basically strong on the surface, but beneath the surface, it's um, you know, unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated and ultimately unsustainable. And so that triggered a huge debate. And the system was flexible enough, broad enough to uh, consider a new uh, solution, a mid-course correction, if you want to call it that. What Wen Jiabao's critique or paradox basically taught me was that the Deng Xiaoping model was flexible enough to be adapted and to change. And so I was even more enthusiastic about where China was headed uh, in the latter half of that uh, that decade. This flexible system could had the capacity to reinvent itself and to focus on the things that I was uh, about to uh, talk about in, uh, in, in teach for my course at Yale, the next China, the shift from export and investment-led growth to consumer-led growth. And it all made perfect sense to me. And I taught it and wrote about it and wrote some books about it. And, um, you know, it seemed to be working. There were, there were still some missing pieces that never quite got finalized, but the overall thrust was good. And then came Xi Jinping. I, like many, were really hopeful that, you know, he was the guy that was going to finish the job that was laid out uh, initially by Deng Xiaoping, modified by Wen Jiabao. He assumes his office in November 2012 as party secretary, immediately goes to the uh, National Museum of China in Tiananmen Square, starts talking uh, very nationalistically about the China dream. But, you know, we just sort of look the other way. So, you know, that's, that's just what new leaders do to make, uh, make a point. And they said, focus on what he's doing. So over the course of his first year, he and his team worked on these uh, you know, comprehensive 
reforms that were enacted in, by a party Congress in late 2013 that offered a lot of promise. And so I continued to be really optimistic. And then, you know, slowly but surely, it became evident that the trajectory under Xi was going to be very different, that nationalism became a justification for a more ideological approach, an anti-corruption uh, campaign, which seemed necessary at one level, uh, became an excuse for power consolidation and political control. And then finally, um, you know, in 2017, just sort of ripped the, you know, the cover off the ball and said, you know, I am all about Xi Jinping thought. Uh, and that permeates literally every aspect of governance, all the working committees that he heads up. And it became a very personalized uh, autocracy. Uh, and the power of the, you know, the, the growth engine shifted away from the private sector, which had looked so promising, back to the ossified, low return, low productivity state on en enterprise sector. And there was a lot of debt associated with that, which was a very Japanese like approach to economic growth. You know, it just became tougher and tougher for somebody like me who's inherently optimistic on China to stick with uh, the, the, the story. And then the final shoe drop for me, all oh, about, you know, a couple of years ago, I think, when the regulatory assault on the internet platform companies began, uh, coupled with uh, the common prosperity, which clearly is aimed at uh, limiting um, wealth accumulation at the upper end of the, the stream, which to me goes right to the heart of the uh, the rewards that entrepreneurs seek to start new businesses. And, um, you know, it just became increasingly evident to me that for an aging society where the working age population is now declining, again, a very Japanese-like outcome, that the one thing that China could do that Japan had not done to offset that would be to boost productivity. And the productivity story was unraveling and going the other way. And so that, to me, was a you know, very disturbing conclusion for somebody who had been so optimistic on China for so long. Do I blame it on, you know, one man? It's, it's hard to do, but, you know, this is a system that uh, has coalesced around him uh, and um, you know there hasn't been much in the way of counter arguments that have been marshaled uh, to uh, suggest that another way is better. And we're now at the point where we're recording this on February 23rd. Uh, this was sort of like a, a, a specter in your book, but I think has gotten a lot realer. Uh, is, you know, now we're having Blinken warning Xi a year later not to arm Russia, which he wouldn't be doing if they weren't considering it. Um, we're already doing it, apparently. So um, we've gone a long way from uh, being really optimistic about the, you know, 13th plenum to arming America's adversary in a proxy war. All right. So so we're on the we're on the Chinese side. W w what's your what's your vision of uh, the sort of false assumptions that China is making about the U.S. and the and the trajectory of the relationship. Well, there's a lot of, you know, I start out with a whole chapter on Chinese censorship, which guarantees that the book will not be published in China, unlike my earlier books, all of which were published in China. So there's a lot of distortion of fact to fit what, you know, the propaganda department, uh, especially under the heavy hand of Xi Jinping, wants to convey uh, both to the home and the foreign audience, the so-called good stories of um, uh, China. So it's, it's rife with false narratives. But, you know, the, the one I would focus on to, to really be emblematic of the distortions that, that China makes for covering up some of its own problems comparable to the motives that we have in the U.S. is this um, failure to complete the consumer-led rebalancing. China did a lot of good things to move the needle from 
exports and investment to consumption by shifting the structure of the economy from manufacturing to services, which employs a lot of people, to shifting the population from rural to urban areas. Uh, that generate a lot of labor income, but it was saved and not spent because they have underinvested in their social safety net, uh, health care and retirement. But they don't want to really admit that. Uh, instead, they blame their failed structural rebalancing, not on their, their, their lack of commitment and reform, but on the efforts of America to contain its peaceful rise. And that's a classic example of a false narrative. There's some fact to it because the U.S. clearly does have a policy aimed at Chinese containment. But to connect that policy to China's failure to reform and rebalance its uh, economy to del deliver more of a consumer-led growth uh, is an inherently distorting a false narrative. For motives that I argue that are really in large part, a function of political expedience. Yes, there is a political agenda in China, just like there is in the U.S. Leaders you know, have a hard time admitting uh, the problems that arise in their countries, their systems, their economies uh, are something that they have control over. The scapegoat is more of a convenient excuse. We've used that a lot in the U.S. Um, uh, we did it with Japan. We've done it with China. And China's doing it with us. And so that uh, is what you know, gives these narratives so much um, play in both, both countries by defensive leaders masking the vulnerabilities of their own systems. And then just one other thing. What is really different about this particular dynamic, uh, I think, um, say, just compared to what was going on with China and the, and the uh, Japan in the 1980s, is the role of social media and the way in which social media platforms amplify false narratives in a nanosecond. And the work that I studied on examining um, false narratives, and there's some very interesting studies that have been done, including some, you know, a book written by Bob Schiller at Yale, once the false narratives get out, and they get out a much faster uh, than ever before, and they reach a much broader community of uh, uh, netizens, it's, it's almost impossible to erase the impression, even if they're fact-checked uh, by history. So that's where we are, and it's going to be very difficult uh, to unwind it. But you know, the book concludes with some you know, suggestions as to how we might try that. So false narratives like the balloon was not a false narrative right but it's it's i think emblematic in that in 1950 that would be like a one day story or maybe not i don't know i mean sputnik was not a one day story right well but look in, in 1960 i think it was may of 1960 we had a, a spy plane the u2 spy plane piloted by francis gary powers that was shot down over the Soviet Union. Uh, we denied that, you know, initially, that it had any um, you know, motives other than just, the, you know, an airplane wandering off into deep Soviet airspace. And, um, you know, that became a, you know, a major flashpoint uh, in, 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 in the Cold War. It led to an instant breakdown of uh, uh, communications between the former Soviet Union and the U.S., um, where relationships had actually been improving prior to the shooting down of that, that airplane. And we went into a very dangerous stage of that uh, first Cold War, you know, the Berlin crisis, eventually the Cuban Missile Crisis. We came extremely close to a nuclear war, a hot war. And that's, you know, we don't want to talk about that right now. We have to recognize that you know, when, when you're in a Cold War, when you have no military-to-military -military communication, as the balloon uh, incident revealed, um, you know, you can have an accident. Uh, in December, we had a near miss over the South China Sea, where fighter pilots from the U.S. and China came within 20 meters of each other. Uh, and again, lacking in communication uh, between the two militaries, who knows where that could go? And and now we're both flexing over the uh, the biggest hotspot 
uh, in, in, in the conflict, which is Taiwan. I think it's, it, it's a scary thing. And this is something the Biden administration, I think, has talked about and in a pretty compelling manner that, like, look, like weird things can happen and you can end up in places you didn't intend. Uh, and particularly, you know, in this media environment, in the in the sort of, you know, in, in the dynamic that we're even at just today, which is not 1960 with the U.S. and Soviet Union. But what what, what makes me even more pessimistic about this is the like. You'd think China would be would recognize that and see the danger. But, you know, we, we, we've seen this multiple times now that like mill to mill communications is it, the, the, the Beijing sees as like a chit to play and give and take away as something that like, oh, America wants it. So we're going to withdraw that to like make them feel pain. I mean, like having fighter jets not bump into each other by accident is not like a trade war negotiate is not like the phase one negotiation of the trade deal well we'll give you soybeans and you'll give us you know textiles or whatever it, it, and i really wonder what to make of that from the chinese side because on the one hand maybe they don't take it that seriously if they're if they're not sort of worried about this or there's a darker version where they're just where the sort of like there's like a, a game of chicken and they think they can drive faster and further because of their system or what have you. I don't know. Do you have any, any thoughts on what's, what's going on there with, with, with she being comfortable turning that sort of dialogue into a, um, uh, you know, into a, into a political football? I, you know, I think that's a fair point. I don't know the real answer to that. I do believe that, uh, and I have participated in, pretty high-level discussions both in China and in the U.S. in the form of these so-called Track 2 dialogues that involve literally senior military officers in the U.S. and in China. And we, we haven't held these in a while because of COVID, but uh, there was deep appreciation at the time that, that the, these were important relationship infrastructure pieces that, that should should really not be uh, ne negotiable uh, in any way whatsoever, and and that has uh, clearly suffered. Is it China's fault? Yeah, I can I can certainly put some blame. You, you know, I, I think China certainly could do a better job in recognizing the need uh, for ongoing uh, communication, especially at the military level. And, I mean, quite honestly, it's generally been pretty successful, but it certainly was not uh, successful at all during this uh, balloon incident. But again, you know, like I'm the relationship guy. So when you push me on that, I'm going to push back on what are we doing? OK, China has sort of pulled the, the military communication option uh, you know, off the table right now. But, you know, in the last... Five or six months, we've sent one Speaker of the House to Taiwan. Uh, the chairman of the new House Select Committee on China, Gallagher, went this week unannounced. You know, we had the senior Pentagon official um, in charge of China go on an official mission to um, uh, Taipei a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the Senate has um, approved this defense authorization bill that has a $10 billion carve out for uh, new arms to, to Taiwan. And there's a story today in the paper about uh, the U.S. is uh, quietly expanding by a significant uh, amount physical military presence in terms of troops being stationed in Taiwan. So, you know, both sides are pushing really hard. I honestly don't think, and I get this from my Chinese context that Xi Jinping has a desire to significantly accelerate uh, the reunification timeline that he's running out of patience. I know there's some talk of that, and there's possibly some uh, text that can be cited uh, to uh, support that. But I think that view is is probably, at the end of the day, not correct. But all these actions I decided that we're taking could force his hand, uh, and so. You got to be careful of the unintended consequences. You may end up getting not what you really wish for, but what you fear the most. On the relationship piece, 
that's almost like the only way to for me to understand why China wouldn't want mill to mill conversations because it's like it's the thing that that Biden seems like he wants the most. And it's kind of one of these like, come on, really? Even this? And it's just like, if you just want to get under someone's skin and find something that <laughs> to get them upset, if you're if you're sort of like stuck in a bad relationship with someone, you you look for whatever it is, even if it's something that isn't in your best interest. And um uh, kind of that kind of dynamic is uh uh, you know, maybe may end up being a being a play here. I mean, I don't know with the with the Taiwan engagement, you can tell another story, right? But I guess there, there there's also an argument to be made on the other side. Yeah, but these actions, if you sum them up, what are they really telling you? They're telling you that Washington, the Congress, and the Biden administration truly, dis- despite sort of their their torture clinging to this notion of the the great one China policy that they're in favor of Taiwanese independence, period. Uh, and these actions are consistent with that. Uh, and you know, that's obviously China's red line. Uh, and the more that we do to uh, fuel that uh, conclusion, uh, I think the more we can expect China to bristle and ultimately act in response. So uh, you know, I think the relationship framework uh, forces you to look at this an issue like this as not being as, as one-sided as the picture that is being painted in washington i don't know if i'd go that far but we're not here to debate uh a <laughs> u.s taiwan policy um okay yeah how do we fix it what's the uh what's the light at the end of the tunnel here if any okay so this is actually the thing that if you want to write a book and you want somebody to remember uh, something the most about um, your book. This is what excites me the most because I I invested a lot in the first eleven chapters of this book in telling the story of a dysfunctional relationship, uh, and it, I even got you to concede that you know you can appreciate the, the relationship framework. So if it's a relationship problem, the only way to fix it is with a relationship solution. The idea of getting you know, one nation to sort of bow to the other and impose its solution on uh, the other is a recipe for unmitigated disaster, conflict, and probably war. So three things that I conclude with. Uh, The first one is is the most obvious, uh, and that is taking small steps to re-engage and rebuild trust. Small steps, not big steps. There's no grand bargain that can be cut at this point. So doing things like reopening consulates that have been closed in both countries during this confrontational five-year period, uh, relaxing um, uh, restrictions on the issuance of uh, visas, uh, which I'm in the process of going through the, you know, the, all the ridiculous torture you have to do to go back to China, which I'm going to do next month. Restarting popular and very successful foreign exchange programs between the two countries. And then tougher things. Um, uh, If you can begin to do the little things, the tougher things are um, uh, relaxing um, constraints on uh, NGOs and then trying to grapple with the big issues of global importance, but are hugely beneficial mutually, whether they're climate, health, or cyber. Those, Those come at sort of the end of the the trust building, um, the, the little ones are the most important initially. If we can begin to engage on these little issues, the low-hanging fruit, then I think we can take bigger steps, uh, which I get into the second and third legs of the stool of my plan. The second one uh, is to go back to the bargaining table and complete negotiations on a bilateral investment treaty. Uh, This is a treaty that the U.S. has with uh, over 45 other countries. China has with over 100. It lowers investment barriers and promotes cross-border investment that open up markets and allow companies in in both nations under negotiated conditions to expand their businesses uh, and benefit their multinational companies. And in doing that, uh, you can add into the so-called 
BITs as they're called, um, you know, a lot of structural issues that have arisen in the last five years, whether they're over um, uh, uh, innovation policy, technology transfer, subsidies of um, state-sponsored activities, uh, cyber issues, uh, and the like. And then the final leg of the stool, which I've been accused of being the most naive about, but I believe strongly, uh, is to um, redo the architecture of engagement between these two countries and set up a permanent organization that I would call a U.S.-China Secretariat, which is engaged full-time, equally staffed by Chinese and American professionals located in a neutral jurisdiction, call it Switzerland. Oh, come on, we can do better than Switzerland. Okay, you know, whatever you want, you know, you, you pick a spot you want to go to that's neutral. Tahiti. Fine, if you can get there, go for it. But I want this organization working 24 seven on a broad remit covering all aspects of the relationship from economics and trade to um, technology and innovation policy to uh, subsidies, even even some of these uh, big issues I mentioned earlier, uh, health, climate, cyber, and even human rights. And, uh, you know, my vision of the Secretariat is not that there would be a Chinese floor and an American floor, but this would be uh, organized functionally in a collaborative way where both sides are charged with producing jointly authored policy white papers that address the, the, the complexity of, of the relationship. We work off a common database. They have the ability to um, convene experts to address tough problems, COVID being a classic example. Uh, and they uh, have the capacity to uh, monitor the implementation of existing and new agreements in when uh, conflicts arise, as they always will, uh, there is a dispute resolution mechanism uh, that the Secretariat is empowered to uh, uh, utilize to address. So what we do right now in terms of engagement is truly pathetic. Biden met Xi Jinping for three and a half hours on November 14th in Bali. The meeting was staffed up a week ahead of time and the people who did the staffing went back to their day jobs of you know, who knows what you know tracking balloons or you know you know other uh, uh, interesting things there's no continuity to the relationship focus in earlier administrations we had big once a year twice a year events strategic and economic dialogues but they accomplished nothing because again there was no continuity between these meetings no policy infrastructure built to manage and address problems on a continual basis. So look, that's my plan. Build trust or rebuild trust, focus on growth through a bilateral investment treaty and uh, the secretariat that really is, is the glue that begins to bind the, the engagement on both sides together. And, you know, I think that is a, a, a relationship package that that has hope and allows me to end the book on a on an upbeat note. I know it made you sad to read parts of it, but um, uh, the resolution framework was designed to offer some hope. I mean, so my re my reactions were after the balloon. It's not just that like there was a balloon, but the reaction to the balloon makes me think that w whatever it is, there's going to be something every two or three months either on the Chinese side or the U.S. side. And it, it, it's hard to imagine. And, and I think there's very little political will on either, on both sides towards taking short-term political hits to potentially try to build something towards, you know, a, 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 a slightly less um, uh, dangerous relationship. So, you know, I mean, I'm all in favor of, Americans doing Fulbrights in mainland China. Uh, and the same comes for, you know, foreigners studying, uh, Chinese studying the U.S. The bit, it seems like we're very, we're, we're in a very far world from Congress being excited about more Chinese money coming into the States. And, you know, on the, on the, um, on the, on the secretariat, I mean, it's an interesting vision of having sort of a, 
a WeWork style, like hot swapping desks of American and Chinese officials, you know, like uh, seeing if they can team up and, 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 and do creative things together to address, address global problems. But the, um, uh, I just, I don't, I don't know if China's interested in that sort of thing. And, and, and if, if everything is going to be on the table, and I think sort of, you know, the Biden administration, they came in open to that sort of thing. You know, they had to compete, the compete, the triple C's, and there was like collaborate somewhere in there. And I think we've seen over and over again over the past few years, China just not being interested and sort of looking at the desire to work together on climate change or, uh, or, or COVID or what have you and, and, and have that be coming back to relationships speak, having that vulnerability be something not to be sort of, you know, patched up and built on, but something to be exploited as a, as a sort of, as a weakness. So, you know, that'd be a fun place to work one day if it ever existed. And I think it's, and I think it's an interesting concept and, 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 and framework, but, you know, I, I, I put that in, 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 in single digits percentage that we'd see. Let me just give you some, uh, you know, feedback from the markets I tested this out in. I presented this package to, to, to both sides. I haven't been to China in over three years, but I am going next month and I will be presenting these views in person, but I've, I've had the opportunity to present them uh, remotely um, for you know, the last year plus. I was in Hong Kong last month and presented this in person to a number of groups. The general feedback from sort of the, the Chinese or greater China that I've gotten right now is, you know, they quibble with some aspects of the various proposals, um, not quite as much as you did, but they, they, you know, there are things that they would tweak and want to suggest differently. But in large part, they buy the idea that the relationship problem is serious enough so that you've got to think about, you know, a fix that, that reflects you know, sort of the re- relationship aspect of bringing both sides into it, which is why I like not just, you know, the low hanging fruit on trust, but, you know, the BIT is a, uh, a mutual tool to open both markets, not one. Uh, and the secretary by definition is a mutual, um, in terms of its uh, arrangement. But, you know, I made the same point to a number of groups in the U.S., uh, both private and public, and the general response is not quite as polite as yours. It's sort of, you've got to be kidding. No way. We're not interested in engagement because, you know, we did that. You know, that's the sort of Washington line. You know, they, they promised us in joining... WTO in 2001, that they would follow our game, play by our rules, become more like us. And they broke those promises. And and now look at what they've done. Uh, And so we don't want, you know, there's no interest in engagement. I go through in the book how I think that narrative over the false promises of WTO was really, again, a classic example of us deluding ourselves into thinking that, you know, our agenda was so awesome and appealing that it could bring, you know, a totally different system into, uh, you know, a, a U.S. framework, which was never the case. But that's beside the point. The U.S., you're right, Jordan, is not interested right now in engagement. And that's what uh, energizes me right now to, to you know, be a you know, proud American who has a political system who is not the least bit interested in engaging I hesitate to use the word competitor because, you know, that uh, does not really have um, the the type of negative connotation that uh, I think Washington views China as in terms of a a mega adversary right now. And so that impression, I think, has to change. Uh, And I'm I'm committed to attempting to make that point Uh, right now. I'm beating my head against the wall, but um, I, I, I just begun. Yeah, I mean, it's it would have to take. I, I, I really think you're right. I think like the like you you've seen 
you saw that like meeting of uh, after the election where all these like fancy old foreign ministers met with um, uh, uh, lots of former Wall Street folks and said, hey, you know, we're open to raising this and that. But this is not 2014 anymore. I, I think an American like overture, the, the, the possibility of that happening in the next five years is like pretty non-existent. And, and, and I don't see she putting anything dramatic on the table and whatever it is that he could put on the table, I don't think people will trust. And honestly, for good reason, for, for my perspective, but I don't know. There's a, there's, there's, there's a very tricky track record to grapple with if you're going to want to try to run back a playbook, which, which people have been uh, very disillusioned with. Um, well, I, I look, um, again, you, you got to look at both sides of the coin, which is the, you know, the, the theme of the book. Um, there's a chapter in the book that is called um, From Trump to Biden, the, the plot thickens. So you know, Trump is certainly not the source of the, uh, the conflict. It had been brewing for a long time, but, but he played a, you know, a catalytic role in accelerating uh, the conflict to where it is today. And so there was understandable hope. And I shared this hope that when Biden came into office, that he would um, uh, reverse at least, you know, the tariffs and, and go negotiate with China on tough structural issues, which needed adjudication. But he didn't do that. I mean, he came into office in the first day of office, January 20th, 2021. He signed uh, over a dozen executive orders. He revoked many of the most outrageous policies of the Trump administration, from the construction of the border wall of Mexico to the Muslim travel ban. He rejoined the uh, Paris Agreement on Climate Change, the World Health Organization. But he didn't touch the, um, uh, the tariffs and has continued through his trade representative, Catherine Tai, to look at uh, China through the uh, the flawed framework of this ridiculous phase one trade trade deal that was you know, thankfully expired at the end of 2022. And moreover, what Biden has done, uh, and you have devoted a huge amount of ink, which you know I follow your you know China talk uh, episodes to this these uh, tech sanctions. Uh, which are far more severe in their impact on China than anything that Trump did. And so, you know, we, you know, we had the opportunity to reset when uh, Joe Biden came into office, and we've chosen, uh, if anything, to um, double down on uh, uh, the, the, the conflict with China. And you know, you're right, China's done some things in the, in, in the meantime that, uh, you might say uh, are deserving of that response, or you might say are in reaction uh, to, uh, to to what we've done. And this is the problem with a, uh, a relationship that is on this uh, inexorable trajectory of, um, of, of of escalation. Until you repair the relationship, it'll it'll go keep going from bad to worse. Your point that something happens every few weeks. I mean. You're right, but it's sort of like Moore's law. It happens more quickly uh, 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 each month than it did the last month. In the last two weeks, we've had, <laughs> I, I can't even you know, begin to count them. There's so many of them. Stephen Roach, thanks so much for being a part of China Talk. Thank you, Jordan. Good luck to you. <laughs>